Coming up in our newscast tonight. President Moon Jae-in gets ready for another diplomacy trip. On Sunday, he will fly to New York for the 73rd session of the UN General Assembly. Through their summit in Pyongyang, President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un agreed on a number of joint projects. They plan to maintain close coordination with the international community to make sure they don't violate any sanctions imposed on the regime. The South Korean government plans to supply 300,000 public homes in various parts of the nation. It's the latest in their measures to stabilize the overheated real estate market and reduce household debt. New Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. The nation's top office announced this afternoon President Moon Jae-in will travel to New York on Sunday. There will, he will attend the U.N. General Assembly and hold a number of bilateral summits on the sidelines. Arirang Shawde correspondent Hwang Ho-jun has our top story. First, he briefed the South Korean people immediately after his return from North Korea. And now, President Moon Jae-in will have a chance to address a global audience on the results of his three-day summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. President Moon Jae-in will embark on a three-night, five-day trip to New York from September 23rd to the 27th to attend the 73rd UN General Assembly. According to Nam, President Moon will arrive in New York on Sunday late afternoon local time. On Monday morning, he will attend an event to raise awareness of the global drug abuse issue, co-sponsored by 28 countries. He is scheduled to hold a bilateral summit with U.S. President Donald Trump, which is when they are expected to sign their country's revised free trade agreement. Soon after, a separate meeting is scheduled with U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, which will mark their fourth encounter since President Moon took office. On Tuesday, President Moon will give a policy speech to about 250 U.S. experts and opinion leaders from think tanks, including the Council on Foreign Relations, the Korea Society, and the Asia Society, where he is expected to discuss the strides that have been made in inter-Korean relations over the past year and his vision for future steps that South Korea and the U.S. can take together to achieve irreversible peace on the peninsula. President Moon will deliver a keynote speech at the U.N. General Assembly once again on Wednesday afternoon. He will likely return back to Seoul on Thursday night Korea time. While this will be the second time President Moon has appeared at the International Forum since his inauguration, his presence in New York this time will likely draw a lot more international attention since the 2018 inter-Korean summit Pyongyang is still fresh in people's minds. The spotlight will especially be on President Moon's bilateral meeting with President Trump, where he'll brief his U.S. counterpart on the results of the summit and quite possibly relay a personal message from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un regarding the, quote, corresponding measures mentioned in the Pyongyang Joint Declaration. Separate one-on-one -on -one meetings with other government leaders will also likely take place. Hwang Ho-jun, Arirang News. The inter-Korean summit was looked to help break the current stalemate between Pyongyang and Washington in their denuclearization talks. The U.S. still remains unchanged in its stance that denuclearization must come first, but it did speak positively about the summit. Lee ji tells us more. The United States is standing firm that no concessions can be made to North Korea in the absence of denuclearization. This is according to State Department spokesperson Heather Nauert on Thursday, who is speaking at a press briefing as South Korean President Moon Jae-in concluded his third inter-Korean summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The joint declaration the two Korean leaders signed says the North will take additional measures, such as the permanent dismantlement of its nuclear facilities at Yongbyon, should the U.S. take corresponding measures in accordance with the spirit of the June 12 Trump-Kim agreement. Now it was asked whether Secretary of State Mike Pompeo wasn't jumping to conclusions by saying there would be inspectors from Washington and the IAEA in the North, but she said there is a shared understanding that they have to be part of it. President Moon and also Chairman Kim did talk about inspectors. Uh, anytime you have a uh, nuclear situation like this uh, where there is a dismantlement, it, the expectation is uh, the IAEA inspectors would be a part of that. So that would just be a uh, normal course of doing business. 
There are concerns that the deadlock could continue despite the latest inter-Korean summit, but the U.S. remains optimistic. In an interview with Fox News, Secretary Pompeo said they have always known that denuclearization was going to take some time and that they have made steady, albeit slow, progress. Pompeo pointed to the outcomes of the latest inter-Korean summit, calling it a successful engagement that secured a promise from the North to dismantle a missile testing site in front of international inspectors. More progress could come next week during a flurry of diplomacy on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly, including this whole Washington summit and possibly a meeting between Pompeo and his North Korean counterpart. Lee ji Arirang News. North Korea's state media reported that Kim Jong-un is determined to denuclearize. It's been covered in the past, but never before on the regime's televised newscast. For details, let's turn to our Park Hee-jun. The North state media were unusually quick in covering the inter-Korean summit in Pyongyang. On Friday, just a day after South Korean President Moon Jae-in returned to Seoul, the regime's Korean Central Television released a 25-minute report on President Moon and his delegation's itinerary in the North. Most notable was its report on leader Kim Jong-un saying he wants to denuclearize. Our leader has emphasized his will to create a peaceful Korean peninsula, free of nuclear weapons and nuclear threats. It was the first time North Korean television has cited Kim talking about these subjects. The video also showed the leaders of the two Koreas announcing the Pyongyang Declaration and the defense ministers of the two sides signing the military agreement. Earlier, the Korean Central News Agency had also reported extensively on the details of the joint declaration, even mentioning the permanent closure of the Dongchangli missile test site and the conditional shutdown of the Yongbyon nuclear test site. Those reports did not neglect to mention Kim Jong-un's possible visit to Seoul within this year. North Korean television and the official newspapers all covered the key events of the summit, including the welcoming ceremony at Pyongyang International Airport, the Mass Games performance, and the trip to Pekusan Mountain. North Korea's exceptional coverage of the summit is believed to be part of efforts to convey to his country and the international community the North Korean leader's sincere commitment to the nuclear eyes. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. At their third summit of this year, the two Korean leaders laid out a number of detailed goals for economic cooperation with some specific deadlines. Oh jung fills us in on what they are and how Seoul and Pyongyang plan to deal with international sanctions. The September inter-Korean summit declaration stipulated specific deadlines for a couple of the detailed goals for economic cooperation, raising questions on how they could be achieved despite the international sanctions on North Korea. It stated South and North Korea will hold a groundbreaking ceremony within this year to connect railways and roads on the eastern and western sides of the peninsula. Though conditions will have to improve, they'll resume South Korean tours to North Korea's Mount Kumgang and restart operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex, a joint factory park they ran until early 2016. The two Koreas will also pursue forming a joint special economic zone on the west coast and a joint special tourism zone on the east coast. The two Koreas will push ahead with environmental cooperation as well, namely forestation, and expand their work together to cover health and medical care too. Seoul says it means to kickstart related construction regarding rail and road connections this year, and the two Koreas have confirmed each other's commitment on that. But the U.S. opts to keep sanctions in place on North Korea until it denuclearizes, and that has been a major concern in inter-Korean economic cooperation, as bringing resources like oil or electricity and infrastructure north of the border violates the sanctions. We basically see that inter-Korean relations should proceed along with denuclearization of North Korea-U.S. relations through a virtuous cycle. We will be respecting the international sanctions and will make sure to closely coordinate with the international community so as not to cause concerns about violating them. The two Koreas faced difficulties in opening the Joint Liaison Office during August, their initially set deadline, as concerns rose that running the office could go against the international sanctions. It remains to be seen whether a denuclearization measure that's strong enough to lower the sanctions could be found so that the two Koreas can push ahead with their economic cooperation in earnest.
Wu Zhongyi, Arirang News. A celebrated South Korean sports figure was also part of President Moon's entourage during the trip to Pyongyang. She expressed hopes of greater sports exchanges with the North. Wang Jung-hwan zooms in on how the Inter-Korean summit will help fuel such activities. South Korean table tennis legend Hyun jong hwa who was part of the special envoy to the North Korean capital, praised the two Koreas for actively promoting further ties in sports. Hyun, a 1988 Olympic gold medalist and three-time world champion, told reporters on Thursday that she is thrilled. The two leaders agreed to cooperate in major sports events, such as the upcoming 2020 Tokyo Olympics, and to also make a bid to co-host the 2032 Summer Olympics. The Pyongyang Declaration signed by South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Wednesday states that the two Koreas will intensify cross-border sports exchanges by fielding unified teams in major sporting events and jointly hosting international competitions on the Korean peninsula. And according to an expert, while forming unified teams can be considered a relatively easy form of cooperation, submitting a joint bid to host the 2032 Olympics requires a whole new level of cooperation. First, the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is important, and in order for the two Koreas to continue their bidding campaign, they need to maintain this peaceful relationship in the long run. Finally, positive relations between North Korea and the U.S. will also be one of the most important factors. Meanwhile, following the success of joint Korean canoeing, rowing, and women's basketball teams at the 2018 Asian Games, South and North Korea are looking to form joint teams in table tennis and swimming for the Asian Para Games in Jakarta next month. According to Seoul's Paralympic sports chief on Wednesday, the two Koreas are also seeking to march together at the opening ceremony of the Asian Para Games on October 8. However, the decision for the two Koreas to form joint teams at the Games still needs to be finalized by the Asian Paralympic Committee. Won Jong-won, Arirang News. It appears the latest inter-Korean summit provided a boost to the South Korean president's popularity at home. According to research firm Gallup Korea, President Moon Jae-in's approval ratings climbed to 61 percent this week. It had been slipping as of late, going down to just 49 percent in the first week of September. During April's Panmunjom summit, his approval rating rose 10 percent. The latest meeting led to an 11 percent spike. The figures are based on 1,000 people surveyed between September 18th and the 20th. The leaders of South Korea's liberal political parties who accompanied President Moon to Pyongyang are looking to hold inter-Korean parliamentary exchanges within this year. While briefing the National Assembly Speaker Moon Yee-sang on the outcome of the trip, the three chairs said they proposed to the North's ceremonial head of state the two Koreas should hold a parliamentary-level talks by the year's end. Pyongyang's response, according to them, was not negative. The leaders claims to have also suggested holding joint celebrations to mark the anniversaries of key events in Korean history. Initially, the chairs of the country's five major parties were invited for the trip up north, but the offer was rejected by the conservative and centrist parties. South Korea's new national defense chief vows to fully implement inter-Korean military agreements reached in the recent summit and actively push forward with follow-up measures. In his inaugural message, Chong kyung doo said he will establish a firm national defense posture to bring lasting peace and prosperity on the Korean peninsula. The minister also stressed that the Seoul-Washington alliance will be further developed as a mutually complementary ironclad alliance while seeking to create conditions for a stable transfer of wartime operational control from Washington. He also vowed to push ahead with the government's ongoing military reform to transform the nation's troops into a stronger and efficient force in line with the changing era. The veteran fighter pilot served as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff until his nomination as defense minister last month. The South Korean government announced plans in August for building 300,000 extra homes to curb soaring house prices. And on Friday, it revealed the specific public housing sites where 35,000 of these homes will be built. This follows the government's stronger countermeasures on speculative housing practices released earlier this year. Ko Ryuni explains further. The Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport on Friday revealed fresh measures to stabilize Korea's housing market. On top of the new rules the government introduced last week to curb speculation. 
The move comes as apartment prices in Seoul, according to the Korea Appraisal Board, rose at their fastest rate in six years last month. The overheated housing market in Seoul and adjacent area is mainly due to excessive concerns about a shortage of housing. The government will strive to provide low-priced quality homes to meet real market demand. The new plan includes supplying 35,000 homes in 17 areas in Seoul, Incheon and Gyeonggi-do province. It aims to provide more than 10,000 affordable homes in Seoul alone, in Songpagu district, Kepodong in Gangnamgu district, and nine other areas that haven't yet been announced. The locations will be confirmed after public inspections, and the homes will go on sale starting 2021. Details about the other 265,000 proposed homes will be announced by early next year. But the ministry did say where 200,000 of them will be built. They'll be in four or five big residential sites, located between Seoul and the new towns of Ilsan and Bundang. Previously, when it provided 20,000 to 30,000 houses consecutively, it was effective in stabilizing prices. Similarly, the government's plan to make four or five new towns and cities is not expected to be effective in curbing prices in the short term, but it might be in the long term. The government did not choose any of the existing Greenbelt areas to build new housing. But the ministry did say it will continue to work with the Seoul metropolitan government to lift restrictions on building homes in those zones. Through these measures to increase housing supply, the government hopes to curb soaring housing prices and hopefully reduce the massive amount of household debt, estimated around 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars. Korunhee, Arirang News. The OECD downgraded its forecast for the global economy, citing escalating trade tensions and tightening financial conditions in emerging markets. Although the U.S. is the source of those trade frictions, it had the brightest outlook among major developed economies. Kim Jian helped us look beyond the numbers. The OECD has lowered its 2018 forecast for the global economy from its May projections by 0.1 percentage point to 3.7 percent, citing escalating trade tensions and tightening financial conditions in emerging markets. According to its biannual interim economic outlook report released on Thursday that focuses on the growth outlook of the G20 group of industrialized countries, the OECD lowered its 2019 projection for the global economy by 0.2 percentage points to 3.7 percent for the same reasons. The U.S. was expected to be the fastest growing of the G7 group in 2018, maintaining its 2.9 percent growth projection for this year, thanks to tax cuts, government spending and steady job growth. The OECD cut its forecast for the two biggest eurozone economies of Germany and France, mainly due to sluggish demand following an industrial recession. The think tank projected Japan to stay on course to maintain its 1.2 percent growth rate for this year and next year on expanded investments, but said recovery in consumption remains weak. The OECD, meanwhile, lowered its 2018 forecast for the Korean economy by 0.3 percentage points to 2.7 percent and downgraded its 2019 forecast by 0.2 percentage points to 2.8 percent. The think tank said Korea's domestic consumption remains steady despite intensifying global trade tensions, but advised the local government to pursue expansionary fiscal policies to help raise household income. It also said that China's weaker currency has so far helped the country absorb the impact of higher U.S. tariffs, leaving its forecast for the Chinese economy unchanged at 6.7 percent for this year and 6.4 percent for next year. Kim Jian, Arirang News. Local farmers were hit hard by the record heat waves this summer. The season conditions led to a spike in prices of meat and produce, which in turn raised overall producer prices. Kim Ye sung has the full story. Korea's producer prices hit a four-year high in the month of August. The Bank of Korea says the producer price index, a barometer of future inflation, reached 105.43 in August, up half a percent on month to at its highest level since August 2014's 105.57. Compared to the same period last year, the index is up 3 percent. The price of agricultural goods jumped over 18 percent in August, making it the biggest on-month jump since September 2010 as vegetable production was hit by the hot weather. 
Prices of watermelons went up by 50 percent, cabbage 91 percent, and spinach a whopping 223 percent. Livestock prices also went up 3.5 percent, with egg prices jumping near 36 percent, while prices of marine products dropped by about 4 percent on month. Prices of industrial goods, electricity and gas edged up 0.1 percent. The price index for the services sector also went up 0.1 percent on month on higher restaurant and hotel prices during the summer vacation season. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. Koreans are transitioning into vacation mode on the eve of the five-day Chuseok, or the Korean Thanksgiving holiday. As with years gone by, traffic heading out of the nation's capital is expected to build throughout the day as people head to their hometowns for family gatherings. Kim Minji help us paint a clearer picture of the mass exodus. South Koreans will enjoy a five-day holiday stretching until next Wednesday as the country celebrates Chuseok, or Korean Thanksgiving. Traditionally, to celebrate a good harvest, Koreans visit their hometowns for a feast with their families or visit their families' graves. Some people started their journeys as early as Friday, with more than 36 million people estimated to be on the move during the holiday period. That's about 70 percent of the country's total population. The Korea Expressway Corporation expects an average of 4.5 million cars to use the country's highways each day during the break. Driving out of Seoul, congestion is expected to be the worst on Sunday morning, while on the way back it's expected to peak on Monday evening, the day of Chuseok. Between Sunday and Tuesday, tolls on the expressways will be waived. Some will take the chance to travel abroad. Roughly 1.2 million people are expected to use Incheon International Airport, the country's main gateway. And to cope with the sharp increase of people traveling during the holiday period, the Transport Ministry will be implementing special transportation measures, including more buses on inner-city routes and more frequent trains and inner-city planes within safe limits. Kim min Arirang News. And as the level of traffic and outdoor activities will likely increase during Chuseok, authorities are preparing to prevent and respond to accidents and emergencies. Seoul City plans to place seven ambulances in particularly crowded areas, including Seoul Station, Yongsan Station, for emergency medical care. Over 140 safety facilities and 150 ambulances will also be ready. Three helicopters will also stand by to respond to accidents on the highways or in the mountains. Other regions are also taking similar measures to ensure public safety. Here in Korea, we dial 119 for emergency services and 112 for the police. You can call 1330 for assistance if you speak English, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Vietnamese, Thai or Malay. You can also download the government official emergency ready app on your smartphone to look up disaster shelters, medical centers, police and fire stations, as well as first aid information in English and Chinese. Time to turn to Michelle Bach at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, what's the weather like through the very long Chuseok holiday? Daniel, there are already many who have hit the roads and it seems to have been the right decision. Now, the rain clouds have cleared out with the exception of Kangwon, the province and the eastern coast where sporadic showers are still in store during this evening. So be extra cautious if you are driving across these regions. Now, as we officially begin our Chuseok holiday tomorrow, conditions are expected to brighten up into a nice, pleasant autumn weather with afternoon highs hitting the warm note without becoming too hot. But the mornings and nights are rather chilly these days for dropping down to 18 degrees Celsius tomorrow morning. And the daytime highs will linger between 25 and 27 degrees as for rising up to 25 degrees, Taegu and Kyungju being hitting both up to 27 degrees. Now, the whole country is expected to be mostly sunny up until the day of Chuseok with the full moon being visible in the clear night skies. But after Chuseok, there is chances of rain on the east coast, so stay updated with the forecast be, uh, before heading outdoors. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
That's all we have for you on tonight's edition of Arirang News Center. Thanks for staying with us. Have a great weekend. As for those hitting the road home for Chuseok family gatherings, do drive safely. Thank <laughs> you.